Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's November 2nd. It's the second day, but mostly first day, if you take weekends off, of Academic Ready Month, or ACRIMO. Um, if you've been involved in an ACRIMO thing before, you'll know that I absolutely hate saying that acronym out loud. Um, so we can just call it November, if that makes sense. But I'm really happy that you're here. Um, this broadcast is through Crowdcast, which is a very fun um, platform there are things on the bottom there are the slides and the um, some of the sheets that I talk about that folder will have more and more resources as the week go, or as the month goes on so you might want to bookmark it um, but also all of those things will be going out in the emails and all of the other channels that I use to communicate um, the resources this month um, if there's any questions about what I'm saying or things that you want me to talk about please feel free to put them in the ask a question button um, I will then um, um, answer them at the end. I've left some. Um, I've left some time at the end of this webinar. It's going to be a short, um, power heavy one. Um, one you can watch on your lunch break. So let's get that started. Um, if you, yeah, it's a big crowd today. I'm really excited. Know that I don't always. I keep an eye on the chat as it's going, um, but it's a little bit harder for me to see that um, if I'm in the middle of presenting. So. Um, if you've got a question, the best place to ask it is in the ask a question button. And with that, here we go. Um, actually, let me let me do this. Okay. First of all, you're here. You made it. It's November. It's 2020. That wasn't a foregone conclusion. <laughs> So I um, want you to, wherever you are, if it feels comfortable, if it doesn't, um, you can sort of do it in your head. Um, it might feel good to close your eyes, but just take a couple deep breaths. Um, I know that as I was preparing for this month and this resources, there were a lot of questions like, do we want an academic writing month? Uh, do we want a place um, to gather? Do we want one extra thing to be on our to-do list? And um, I just, I think we do, but I think we need to do it a little bit differently. Um, in other years, we might have been really focused on word count or on that end goal or on getting that writing done, whatever whatever cost, however it happens. Um, and I think there's going to be a certain amount of whatever happens this month. Um, but I don't want anybody to think that any of these resources or any of, any of what I'm about to say in this webinar um, is created or intended for you to use it to ignore the fact that you're a human living on this planet in 2020. Um, I know that there are people here who are newly locked down after a couple of months of being um, less restricted. I know that there are people who w had planned to teach in person that are now shifting to remote. I know that there are some people in the US who have all sorts of things going on. Um, and I just want you to know that I know that the stress of this year, the stress of this situation, isn't at all distributed equally. Um, there are some of us who are asked to bear much more of that than the others. And that isn't to shame anybody and say that, if, oh, if you only have 20% of the pandemic or sort of associated catastrophe stress, um, you need to do 100 extra words a day. That's not what this is about. Um, this is about giving you the permission to say, this is what works for me. This is the rhythm that I'm going to focus on this month. These are the goals that make sense. Um, and I'm going to leave the rest of it where it is. Um, take what's useful and leave the rest. I have purposefully made this month um, something that is a little bit more private. You'll notice there aren't as many places to kind of publicly share your goals, and that's on purpose. Um, you are free to share them in our Slack space or tweet about them on Twitter, um, but I really just wanted to emphasize that this month, the writing is for you. Um, it's, it's for your goals. It's for your process. It's for your degree. It's for moving you forward. It's for your manuscripts. Um, and as much as possible, it's not about putting up huge word counts or, you know, sacrificing sleep and meals to get all of this done. It's about using what you have to move forward. So you're here. You made it, um, even if it's not quite live. 
So the thing that we're going to talk about today, and I was just looking at the poll, it seems like most of us are um, very into checking off as many things as possible. So if you're a person who likes to put things on your to-do list just to check them off, um, this webinar is for you. And I also think that this webinar is really important for anybody who is feeling daunted by the amount of work that they can or should get done during this month or even through the end of the year. Um, I know that <laughs> when I look at my own to-do list for this month, it's a little bit scary. Um, there are a lot of reasons why um, you might look at a big goal, like finish the chapter or submit the dissertation and just uh, panic moonwalk, as they say, away from that and onto your couch to watch a little Netflix. Um, the goal of this webinar is to give you a bunch of strategies for thinking about different ways of setting your goals, um, different ways of breaking them down, different ways of measuring them, so that the uh, path to victory, so to speak, feels as achievable as possible. So um, the first step is to think about the big goals that you're trying to do and then translate them into smaller steps. So these are three questions that I use with my clients all of the time. Um, I find that these three questions are both um, beautifully clarifying in their simplicity and ones that we're not often asked to ask ourselves as academics. Uh, we will say things like, my goal is to finish chapter three of my dissertation and just assume that everybody knows what a chapter is, what a three is, is, what parts are involved, how long it takes, and those things really vary from person to person. They vary from discipline to discipline, and they might vary for you for chapter to chapter. Um, so thinking about let's be as practical, practical and specific as possible um, with our goals so that we can make as clear and supported a plan as possible. So first of all, get out your pen and paper, get out your notebook, um, or you know, bookmark this and do it later. But what is the big goal? And then what are the main parts of that goal? So if your goal, um, and we'll talk about all of these questions in a second, and then what are the supporting actions? What are the things that you're going to do to support that goal in moving it forward? So for example, your big goal could be a dissertation chapter <laughs> and the main parts might be the actual sections of writing. So you have a method section or you have an introduction section or a literature review section or, um, you know, this case study, that case study, this theory, that theory. Um, the main parts of that might be getting each of those sections drafted. Um, maybe then it's editing each of those sections, formatting each of those sections, revising each of those sections or it might be preparing the data or preparing the literature. And then there are all of these supporting actions that feed into those main parts. So you might need to read um, secondary or primary sources. You might want to outline um, so that you have a sense of what you're gonna say. There's all of the drafting, of course, which is the only part that some of us seem to consider writing. Um, but then there's also the revising or the rewriting. That spoiler alert, the best writers you know are also some of the best revisers that you know. Or submitting it to a writing group or to your advisor for feedback. Um, so as you can see, dissertation chapter is big, but each of these things feed into it and it's much easier to put on a to-do list or a weekly plan, I want to read these five articles than it is to say, I just want to work on my dissertation chapter, however that looks. There are also phases in each one of these goals and steps, right? So in the early phase of a dissertation chapter, you might be doing some pretty expansive reading. You know, you're reading all of these books or everything on that topic, or you're preparing all of your data. You might be in the lab or you might be in the archive, just, you know, ingesting huge amounts of information. You might be making brain maps or some other sorts of notes to organize ideas, outlining, free writing, draft zero. All of those things are writing, <laughs> just like everything in the middle is writing. You might have a long outline where you have all of your literature inputted and your quotes and your pages and your citations with all of your ideas. The middle might look like multiple drafts, a draft zero that has, you know, big holes in it all the way through to a draft four or five. It might look like writing by section by section or some sort of targeted reading. You know, you get feedback that says, um, if somebody, could you cite this person or a little bit more here where you go back into the literature and you reread things to kind of bring them in. And then you've got all of this stuff in the late session section, you know, revision, targeted writing, rewriting a section, rewriting this, formatting, copy editing, um, resolving comments from your feedback. Um, 
all of those things to me are writing. All of them move your draft forward. All of them are different. They require different amounts of energy. They require different amounts of time. They require different amounts of brain power and resources, but they all count. And each one of those are different things that you can put on your to-do list and sort of conceptualize so that it isn't just every day in November, I write write dissertation chapter on my <laughs> to-do list. It's that I'm really clear about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it so that I can make the most of that specific amount of time. Unfortunately, for almost all of us, we expect and often the over kind of arching narrative for academics is that we write in a linear way. You know what you're going to write, you might outline it, you write a draft, you revise that draft, you copy edit that draft, you send that draft away. And for most of us, it actually is much more of a circular process where you kind of, you know, you jump from the early and you start to draft and then somebody gives you some feedback. So you're all the way back here, free writing a new section. And then you outline that and then it goes here and then maybe, you know, a reviewer two comes and knocks you all the way back here and says, I want you to really focus on this new thing. Um, this anywhere in here, you're doing the thing you're writing, you're doing it. It's about being aware of what stage you're in and how you're going to support that stage so that you have a clear sense of what you're doing and why. Um, but knowing that the path for almost all of us is not a straight down this column, this column, this column, no notes all the way around. Most of us are looping backwards and forwards through these kind of early, middle, and late stages. So that's all good and fine. <laughs> Here are the different steps that we might take. How do we move then from this big idea, like a dissertation chapter, into what am I going to do today, a Monday? Or what am I going to do tomorrow, a Tuesday? Um, if you're in the US tomorrow, you might not be writing. <laughs> but that's a whole other topic. So thinking about, OK, the big goal, we're going to use that to determine the milestones. When do I want to have a draft? When do I want to submit to my advisor, for example? When do I want to send it to my writing group? And then the main parts. Using that to create your framework or your plan for the week. Um, so here are the different parts of this main goal. This is how I'm going to spread them out over a week, over a day, over a couple of days. And then the supporting actions, which you will use, or maybe if you'd like to, I invite you to, use them to create your menu. And we'll talk a little bit about what a menu is in a second. So breaking these down, the milestones. Backwards planning from your final due date. So if you know that you need to submit your chapter to your committee for your annual review on December 15th, you're going to want a backwards plan from that actual date all the way back to today, November 20, you know, November 2nd, and say, if I need to have this completely copy edited by the 15th, when do I want to send it to my writing group for early feedback? When do I want to send it to my advisor? And so on and so forth. Those dates are just guesses, which is why you might want to build in a little bit of buffer time. Um, I think buffer time at the end of a due date is what makes a lot of sense for most people. You know, I want to have everything totally wrapped up on December 1st so that I have two weeks in case I need it. But I would encourage you to add a little bit of buffer time all the way through the process. If I want to have a final date, you know, a final draft of this chapter ready for my writing group on November 22nd, Maybe I aim to have everything drafted the 18th so that I have three or four days to kind of polish that and get it ready or to account for the fact that between, you know, the third and the fifth, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to. So um, adding in a little bit of buffer time throughout the month instead of just sort of bookmarking it at the end can also help bring down a little bit of anxiety, um, knowing that you have a little bit of open time to use how you need it to. Um, and then knowing that there's some sort of overlap here. Um, I think many, many clients of mine that I come with are like, when do I know how to stop reading? Or when do I know when it's time to start writing? And I like thinking about all of those stages and all of those ideas as things that are kind of overlapping. You're reading you know, this book, but you're also writing up notes from the articles that you read last week. You're outlining this new section, and then you're drafting. 
the section that you outlined yesterday. Um, you might be reading and um, taking notes, free writing, and putting that into your draft zero. Um, but thinking about these, these processes as concurrent lets you not only start the writing a little bit earlier and give you more time to write, but also it gives you a little bit of a choice <laughs> for what you're going to do, which we'll return to in a second when we talk about menus. Um, so thinking about your framework, and these are the questions that I ask myself at the beginning of every week. If you're in my community, you know that these are the questions that I ask every Monday. What will you focus on this week? How will you measure it? and what's working and what needs a little bit of support. So if you know that this week, the beginning of the month, you're really focused on reading, um, what are the most important things for you to read? What are the second most important things to read in case you have time? What are the things that you're consciously giving yourself a break and saying, I'm not gonna be reading those right now and I'll come back to them if I need it once I make my outline? Um, how will you measure what a good day is? And we'll talk about that a little bit in the, um, a couple more slides, but are you going to measure it in palms? Are you going to measure it in word count? Are you going to measure it in pages written? How, how will you know <laughs> what you've done and how much is enough? And then what things are working and what things need support? Um, these last two questions are things that are changing all of the time. Um, Last week, I was doing a really good job at getting to my desk by 9 a.m. every week, and today was a little bit later. Um, so I want to focus on getting to my desk at a reasonable time so that I settle into my work. Um, but it might be that as your desk time shifts, your exercise also really picks up. It's always a matter of sort of tweaking and balancing. This is working and this isn't. But checking in often, checking in every week, can give you a chance to make smaller changes more frequently as opposed to the I'm going to change everything about my life on today, November 2nd, because it's the start of academic writing month. Um, the menu idea is something that I've written about on my blog, but I think is also really useful, especially for months like academic writing month, where there feels like a lot of pressure, like I need to work, 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 work. Um, but having just the idea of work on my dissertation chapter might be a little bit anxiety producing. So maybe you want to create some categories. What are some of the tasks that you can do in your reading? What are some of the tasks that you can do in teaching or in writing or in your service work? or in your activism work or your community support. Um, then if you have a list of things in each one of those categories, and I will link to the blog post in the comments, um, I'm just writing myself a note to do that, um, where I explain this concept in more detail. But giving yourself some choices reduces decision fatigue. And decision fatigue, I believe, is the number one cause of burnout for people during the day. Not the over sort of existential burnout, but the reason why your brain is completely fried at whatever time it becomes fried at is because you've had to make a lot of decisions. So knowing ahead of time, these are the things that I could read, and then you just pick from that list. Like when you go into a restaurant and you know you're getting breakfast, you flip to the breakfast section, and then you pick from one of those seven things. It's about saying, okay, how can I make a reading section of this menu so that when I know it's time to read, I pick one of those things and I don't have to decide what the most important is. I don't have to shuffle around. Any of those are going to be good. Um, menus can also help you figure out what a balanced meal is. So you know that if you've gone to your to-do list restaurant and only picked writing things <laughs> for the rest of the day, that eventually you might run out of writing things to do. You may have eaten every writing thing on the menu, so to speak, and your teaching has really gone by the wayside. So thinking about it as, okay, for a balanced meal, I want to have one thing for my reading category, one thing for my writing category, and maybe one thing for my teaching too. Um, but thinking about all of those goals as broken down into smaller steps that you can choose from, as opposed to just one big goal that's breathing down your neck all of the time. Um, the smaller the goal, the easier it might be to wrap your mind around. So um, one thing that I've really had a lot of success with is this idea of you pick two as a management. And this is something that I've also written about on the blog, um, but I very much like the restaurant Panera, 
<laughs> knowing that you can pick, um, pick and choose from different ways of measuring goals or frequencies to give yourself a structure that still gives you a little bit of flexibility. So the same idea as a menu, that it has ideas um, that you can sort of pick from and you've done the work of deciding ahead of time. This gives you um, the work of deciding how you may or may not structure your day ahead of time with still a little bit of flexibility. So um, the way that it works in practice is basically you commit to two of these <laughs> columns um, for a week or maybe two weeks, however much you want to say it, so that you can set a goal that's got a little bit of flexibility but still has some structure. So for example, say that right now I am very focused on getting my dissertation done. So I'm picking dissertation tasks and I'm going to commit to doing, um, I'm gonna work on my dissertation every day. And it doesn't matter in the duration column, I'm sort of muting that out, <laughs> but I'm gonna work on my dissertation every day. So I, you know, 15 minutes on Mondays because I'm teaching and then maybe I do an hour on Tuesdays and then on Wednesdays are my deep focus days, so I do four hours, but it doesn't matter how long I spend on it. It just matters that I set the goal of, I'm gonna to touch my dissertation every day. Or maybe daily is a frequency that you just can't commit to and you have no idea what's coming down the week. So instead you say, okay, I really wanna focus on my reading this week. And anytime I say that I have a little bit of time to do my reading, I wanna sit down and I wanna read an article. And whether that happens twice a day or on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I'm not going to worry so much about how often it happens. Just that when I have the urge to read, I'm going to focus on my reading and I'm going to read an article. Um, or maybe you say, I have so many different projects that need to happen right now. Um, I just can't pick between them. It's always going to be fluxing. Some things are going to be urgent. Some things won't. But I'm committing to 100 palms on any of my tasks over the course of this month, which of course is one of the things that we have a template for from the tending year, who is a productivity coach and she has an amazing 100 palm a month tracker that you can color in or use stickers for. Um, it's a lot of fun in that way. But you know, you don't commit to any task in specific, but you have this structure, this goal that you're working for. I have found that this has been a really useful way to think about your structure even though you might not be able to say, I'm committing to you know 10,000 words or whatever the sort of high goal is. I'm committing to 100 palms this month, or I'm committing to an hour of reading every time I can fit it in. The last sort of powerhouse tool that I wanna share is the ABC list. And if you've been in the Thrive community for any amount of time, you will know that this is how I plan my days. Um, this is a to-do list structure that was passed on to me when I was taking my comprehensive exam. So I think at this point I've been using it for almost 10 years. Um, but I love it and it works. <laughs> so um, this is the idea that you separate your tasks. Instead of having just a to-do list that's 100 things long or 50 things long, you say, okay, in the A column, here are all of the things that must get done today. Um, and just for full disclosure, sometimes in my A column, it's you know, this thing is due to my editor, or I need to get this back to a client. And sometimes the things in the A column are, I really need to take a shower today, or I am completely out of clean clothes and I need to get my laundry done. But the A column is reserved for things that must get done today or else. The B column are things that would be really great if you got them done, but if you don't, nothing's gonna fall down or set on fire. Um, so the B column are things like, you know, I'm running low on clothes, so it would be great if I could do a little bit of laundry today, but if it doesn't, I still have underwear for tomorrow that kind of thing. Or it would be great to get five papers graded because I'm turning them back on Friday, but if I don't, I'll be able to really make it up this week. And then the C column are things that you're explicitly giving yourself permission not to do today. Um, these are things that, you know, you know that you have something due on Friday, but realistically, you're just not going to get it done. So you put it on the C column so that you remember to do it, so that you know that it's important. But you also can say at the end of the day, if I did everything in my A and B column, just because I didn't do the things in the C column, 
doesn't mean I had a terrible day. It just means that I said I wasn't going to do it and I'm not going to do it. As opposed to the idea that either I do 100% of my to-do list or I have a terrible day. Um, the other thing that's really, really useful about this list is that you can then sort of manage your expectations. So if you sit down with your ABC list and you put 15 things, which amounts to 18 hours of work in your A column of things that must, must, must get done today, then you know that there might be some realignment that needs to happen. Are all of these things truly on fire and urgent? <laughs> Do I need to push some of these deadlines so that people have some heads up that things might be late? Or is my anxiety really, really insisting to me that I have to get everything on this column done or else? Um, I am constantly shuffling things between my A and my B column. Many times in the morning, I will start with more things in my A column that by lunch I realize are just not that urgent and I'm going to need to move them over. Um, so using this as kind of like a flexible system can also help you keep an eye on things. That being said, if you get to your desk and all you do are the B and C column things, you know, you make those dentist appointments, you clean the dishes, you do all of the stuff that would be great to get done and you're avoiding the very big flashing things in your A column, it's also a good gut check to be able to say, okay, do I really not feel ready to do the A things? Do I need to call in a little bit of support? Are things really falling off the rails? Do I need to ask some help? Um, it's a good way of being able to just sort of privately check in with yourself and say, why am I avoiding these important things? What can I do about it? Which brings us all into bite-sized chunks. So the smaller the chunk, the easier it is. And I don't want to underestimate, it takes a fair amount of brain power to break big things into smaller chunks, to be able to say, okay, what are the pieces of this chapter and what sources do I need to say and what things can I do to make that list? Um, it might take you a little bit of effort, but I find that if you get into the, the planning zone, you can do a lot of this sort of higher level intellectual planning work, get your list ready, get your menus ready, get your to-do list sort of sorted, and then it makes it a lot easier to execute. So a little bit of preparation for a lot more fluidity as you go. But it might also be useful to make yourself a list of things that you can do when you have five minutes. Um, can you update citations? Can you send some emails? Can you follow up on conferences? Can you look at table of contents alerts and see if there are things that you want to move into your read pile? Um, making the most of those five minutes can be really useful, especially if your world is, you know, on fire and you might only have five minutes at a time. The last sort of powerhouse. Um, tool to think about is power hours. And this is something that I've taken from Gretchen Rubin, who is, I think she's calling herself a happiness coach now at this point. Um, but her thing is that sometimes it can be really motivating to set aside an hour and just do as many of the annoying small tasks as you possibly can. You know, you go through and you update your CV and you make your dentist appointment and you clear out those emails and you unsubscribe from the news alerts that you don't need to and you send cards for birthdays and you do all of that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, you can make them an academic theme power hour. You can make them a reference theme. You can do a life one. Um, but an hour to just do as many of those annoying tasks as you can. Sometimes it feels really fun, actually, in the sort of like hard workout way of fun, where you're just like, yeah, I did 20 things that hour. And they're usually 20 things you've been avoiding because they're taking up a lot of space in your brain. And sometimes it's nice to just clear the decks. Um, so big fan of power hours. Um, so we've got all these goals. So how are we going to measure our progress? And we'll talk a little bit more about measurement when we have the next webinar, which is all about kind of schedules and routines. But it might be useful for you to think about right here at the start of academic writing month, what's going to be motivating you? Um, is it that you have a partner that you text every day and you tell them, you know, this is what I said I'm going to do and this is what I've done. Maybe you go into our Slack space and you post it in the accountability channel. This is what I'm going to do. And then you reply at the end of the day and you let us know if you did it. Um, this is the example of um, one of a past client's um, word count and they would update their word count every day and color it in a new rainbow. Um, this is incredibly motivating, especially if you like rainbow 
rainbow colors. Maybe you use the 100 palms tracker and you, you know, you fill in different of the tomatoes. Maybe you have a sticker chart where every day that you show up to work on your writing, you put another sticker on it. Um, but thinking about the tracking as additive, so it's not so much that you're keeping track of the streak or whether or not you've not done something, but you're just adding to the pile. You know, today I read two articles and then tomorrow I added three, so I'm up to five. Um, thinking about it less as the, I need to have a perfect month where I hit every single day and more, I'm gonna watch my word count grow or my um, articles read pile grow or my exercise, you know, days grow thinking about it as additive rather than punitive. And then what can you do to set your space? Um, I know that so many of us right now are working in spaces that we didn't imagine working in. Um, if you're a person who misses their coffee shop, welcome. I would um, do a lot of things to be back working in my routine of coffee shops and um, libraries again. But it might be useful to say, okay, this is a special month. How can I think about um, setting my writing space so that it feels a little bit more cozy? Um, maybe I've been writing for the last couple of months on my couch, and this month I'm going to try writing at my table, or I'm going to try writing on my porch, or I'm going to try writing somewhere else. Or maybe you're a person that makes like a go bag that says, this is my academic writing month bag. Here are all of the books that I'm supposed to read. Here's my reading notebook. Here are my highlighters. Here are my pens. And when it's time, I'm ready and I take it out. And there's also some snacks in there. Um, but thinking about how you can create the active change of space to support this work. Just like it feels special to walk into a library, it's quiet, there's books there, there's everything you need, there's internet, there's lamps, all of those things. How can you think about having spaces where when you walk into them or you step into them or you create them, it has everything you need so that you can activate that change and feel like it's something different than just your, um, <laughs> I keep thinking about that cartoon where somebody's like, yeah, from, from 8 a.m. to noon, this is my doom scrolling couch. And then from noon to one, it's my lunch couch. And then from one until 10 p.m., it's my anxiety about not working couch. And then I sleep on this couch as well. Um, thinking about ways to sort of change and have a little bit of variety so that it feels different. It feels motivating. It's not gonna fix it, obviously, but it might help. And then to kind of sum up this part of it, what worked for you before, even in other academic writing months, might not work now. And but maybe on the converse of that, what has never ever worked might suddenly work for you. I know that I have never been a writing in the afternoons kind of person. And right now my magic writing time is from three to 7 p.m. I don't know why it is, but I'm also not fighting it. Like, look, this is just what's working. Um, and it might change as it gets darker, you know, at 3.30 p.m. now where I am at in the Northern Hemisphere, I might not have such great luck writing after it's dark. And that's okay. I'll just move it. I'll see what else works. Um, but this month, making a little bit of space for your projects. I know that so many of us are, um, we're caring for kids, we're caring for family, we're caring for community, we're managing Zoom school, we're teaching on Zoom, we're doing all sorts of things that really take our focus away. Um, Academic Writing Month can be a really good place to say, okay, for just a little bit of time, as often as I can manage it. I am going to write on purpose. And even if that's only 15 minutes, it's going to move me forward because I made the most of those 15 minutes because I knew what things I could do that would move me forward. And I made it a goal to prioritize myself and to see how those 15 minutes actually stack up and help me. So next up, there's going to be a new blog post this week called Read on Purpose that's going to have some sort of templates for worksheets that you can do, but um, is aimed at thinking about your reading in a way that will maximize efficiency and minimize uh, what I call reading rabbit holes. There's also a retreat from thir on Thursday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
There will be an email Thursday with resources and treats and worksheets. So make sure that you're checking for that. And then the schedule on purpose, routine on purpose webinar will be here in this exact same space in two weeks. So I am now going to um, stop sharing my screen and um, answer some questions. So question, where where could we find the 100 palms chart? So the 100 palms chart is located in the emails. Um, it's one of the resources down at the bottom. If you have trouble finding it, let me know. Um, I am really excited to have that from um, the attending year, who's a really cool productivity coach who I found on Instagram. So, okay. Reading how many articles a day is ideal. I'm a first year PhD student and there are so many readings every week for writing summaries. Every week I struggle to cope. Please advise. Um, so this is something that I'm definitely going to talk about on the read on purpose E, um, blog post. But what I would say is that it is impossible for me, a person who is not you and is not in your field and doesn't know how fast you read or how completely you read to tell you how many articles is a good amount or not. Um, what I can tell you is that most PhD students, especially grad students um, who have never encountered the the skill and process of ingesting large amounts of information that are making the jump from um, undergraduate where you sort of read what's on the syllabus and there's a finite number to sort of grad school where you could literally read anything in the world and it might or may not be relevant. Um, you've probably never had a chance to practice the skill of reading efficiently. So thinking about what you can do with your reading to not try and make it so that you're hitting the goal of I've memorized it, I know everything in here backwards and forwards, but more reframing it as reading is a way for me to A, figure out what this is about on a high level, B, organize this information so that I can find it again, and C, figure out how it relates to whatever context I'm reading for. So whether that's a class or your exams or a um, your own project or a lit review, each of those contexts is going to shift. Um, but what I would say just in general, most grad students struggle with the shift from I need to read every word and memorize it to I need to read efficiently. And um, what counts as efficient reading really varies from um, from discipline to discipline. But thinking about if you need to produce summaries for reading, what are the most important facts that you would put in a summary? And how can I find those quickly and then make sure that I master those ideas? Um, but Reading is definitely a skill. I do find that you get better with it over time. And I'm always happy um, to share more about that in that blog post. So if you still have questions after that comes out tomorrow, let me know. Um, I'm happy to help. Okay. Um, how can you backwards plan when you don't know how long steps will take? Very, very brilliant question. Um, unless you are a person who um, can see the future you know, amazingly clear, you probably don't know how long it's gonna take, which is why I tend to think about it in terms of milestones as opposed to due dates. So um, say you are going to start on your next milestone, which is like read all of the foundational literature for this, um, for this, you know, this chapter. I'm going to, just as an estimate, give myself two weeks based on the idea that I know that it takes me about an hour to read one of these articles and I've got X amount of articles in this amount of days. So you just, you take a best guess. And then you say, okay, one week in, I will evaluate say, you know, where am I in regards to this milestone? Do I need to move it? Are there things that I can do to move forward more efficiently? Um, so thinking about the milestone dates 
as less of less due dates that if you don't get it done, you're not going to make it and more like milestones so that if you're consistently four or five weeks behind your milestones, you can reach out for help and say, okay, you know, I said I was going to start drafting on X day, but I'm actually really still in the reading. Do I need to check in with somebody and say, um, am I reading too deeply? Am I reading too broadly? Am I actually ready to start writing? Um, can I start devoting some of the time that I was spending on reading to writing, um, but using them as metrics to, that drive your evaluation and less like due dates can be really helpful. Um, it's also useful to backwards plan in that you know how long other people might be spending in certain phases, and then you can kind of check against that too. So um, I understand that that can be more of a complicated question if your cohort is, you know, remote or if you don't have places to work. But if you um, say to your advisor, you know, I've really been focused on writing and I've written X amount of pages in four weeks, how does that sort of match up with what you might expect? It gives you some data to sort of evaluate how quickly you're moving relative to other people. Um, but yeah, the plan is more so that you understand the workflow and how things can sort of be fluid or not fluid within them and less that you're accurately predicting ahead of time how long things will take. So hopefully that was helpful. Okay. If you're coming up on a major deadline, say within a week, do you think me menus are still helpful or is it time to get strategic about planning on how to meet that, that deadline? If it's helpful to strategize, do you have any tips on how to do that efficiently? So I would say that I still always use menus in that I don't like to give myself like you must do this or else <laughs> because that is a one-way ticket to me avoiding my work. Um, but I think it is useful to sort of reduce the amount of choices, if that makes sense. So rather than saying, okay, I have a menu and there's 18 choices and six different categories. And as long as I do one of those, I'm great. Saying, okay, I can either work in my reading category or my writing category. And in each one of those, instead of eight choices, I have three choices. Or maybe it's just a simple either or. You can either do the dishes or work on your chapter. You know, you can um, answer those emails or you can do your citations. Um, so I think that it's still, it's still useful to give yourself choice, but the closer that you get to a deadline, the more you might want to restrict those choices so that you can kind of keep yourself closer to where the goal is. Um, although I will say that the closer that the deadline is, the more clarity you have about all of the things that need to get done. And it might look more like here's 18 small things that I could do. And if I do any of those, it's a win. Um, but yeah, in general, I think it's useful to always give yourself a choice, even if those choices are between two chores. You know, you can clean the bathroom or you can unload the dishwasher. Um, the other helpful strategy thing, now that I'm thinking about it, is sometimes to say you can do anything but. <laughs> so I know that when I have a deadline, I can tend to procrastinate with Netflix. And so a lot of times I start with my rule that is like, I can do anything that's in any of these task categories today. I just can't watch Netflix or I just can't, um, you know, go grocery shopping, whatever thing you're going to do to kind of not do your work, you can do anything but that. So um, limiting your choices helps with strategy, I would say. Okay. All right. So that was really fun. I hope that there were some things that were useful in there for you. Um, like I said, there's a lot of new things coming up this week. Um, this broadcast will be available for you pretty shortly. It'll be processed. So feel free to go back if there are things that are useful. Um, that folder will have, it has the ABC list in it already. It also has these slides. Um, but I am wishing you the best and most supported academic writing month that you can have. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and let's go right on purpose. See you soon.